Welcome to Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are live here in the studio this week. Um, I'm actually getting ready to head out on what I'm calling my Asia Pacific Innovation Tour. Um, I'm heading out next Sunday. I will be in Japan for two weeks, one week in Tokyo, one week in Kyoto, doing some um, a little bit of uh, vacation time, but also obviously squeezing in some work, going to grab, grab some interviews, bring those back to play here on the show. And then I'm off to New Zealand, where I'll be part of the New Zealand government Callahan Group's uh, workshops. I'm teaching three days of workshops in Auckland, New Zealand. So if you're in New Zealand and you're interested in participating, you can hop on over to the Kill Innovation site, look at the events, um, and check those out. I think actually, let me correct that, you want to go over to philmckinney.com and check the events um, down in the right-hand column. And all the registration links are there. I know a bunch of you in New Zealand are big listeners to the show. So you're going to want to hop on over. Then I'm going to head over to Australia, do some more meetings, meet with some uh, innovators there, and then uh, head back. So I will be um, on the road. So we will not be live in the studio um, for the next four weeks. Um, the show will go on. I've pre-recorded the shows. You can pick those up as a podcast. You can also listen live, but we will not be on Facebook Live um, for the next four weeks. Hope that's clear, and uh, if you've got questions or things that come up and you want to uh, reach out to me, I will be on email. As always, you can email me at phil at killinnovations.com. There's no filtering. There's no staff that previews that. That's an email address that comes directly to me from you, the listener. So if you have questions um, on anything around innovation, creativity, and design, go ahead. Feel free. Drop, the, uh, drop me an email, and uh, I may be a little bit slower than normal getting back to you, but... Um, I'm usually pretty diligent on wanting to get back and uh, um, answer any questions that you might have, help you out wherever um, I uh, can. So this week we have a special guest. Um, this special guest is somebody that I've known, oh, I don't know, it's got to be since 2000, I guess, um, uh, and who I am just a big fan. Um, this person has done, you know, had, a, had a phenomenal career starting off in engineering and then ultimately making it into executive leadership roles, but just really um, an inspiration to um, being able to combine both an in, that engineering background, the business background, and to be leaders involved in um, some very high-profile kinds of projects and activities, and then going on to um, other executive leadership. So I'd like to introduce everybody to uh, Gretchen McLean. Gretchen um, is somebody that I've known. What was it? When was it, Gretchen? When when did we meet? When you were still at NASA, was that? Well, the launch was in 1998, so oh. it was November time frame when we launched the first element of the space station. I got to meet you and your wife and your children. Yeah, that's right. 1998. Gretchen and I were talking before we got on today, and I was telling her that you know my kids were well. My oldest was a teenager at the time. Um, in fact, my youngest couldn't even do some of the tours because he was underneath the age category. Now they're 32, 30, and 28, which made Gretchen and I feel old, you know, at that point. Um, but they still talk about watching the shuttle go up and take the first element, uh, the, US, uh, the U.S. module up for the, uh, the International Space Station. And I still remember it. It's, it's one of those things that you go to. But Gretchen, when I met Gretchen, you were well, you were in charge of the International Space Station program at NASA at that time. You were the, what, the chief director, I guess, was your title? Yeah, it's an easy way to think about it. it the government had a, a long title. It was associate administrator um, of space flight. Um, so the kind of the program manager really integrating the International Space Station and, and working a lot with the international partners as well as Congress and the administration to get our funding and getting the approval and, of course, trying to work with our scientists on what the objectives were. Well, I want to come back to that because particularly, you know, I, you, know you, you shared some stories about your work with the Russians because it was kind of this unique partnership around the modules and getting those built. I want, I want to come back to that because there's some great talk about fighting the, the innovation antibodies when you got to go get funding from Congress in order to do something as important as the International Space Station. But let's back up. You, you got, you're, you're a mechanical engineer by, by training from, from your undergrad, right? That is correct. So what was your inspiration to become an engineer? Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I was always good in math and science. And, of course, my father, who was a mechanical engineer, um, 
thought it was very important for us to get a foundation of math and science, those critical thinking skills that you refer to so often, um, to be able to solve problems, to be able to look at different scenarios and different alternatives and, and have the, you know, the math skills, the methodology to kind of work through a problem. And so of four children that my father and mom had, three of us ended up being engineers. I was the youngest. I really didn't want to be an engineer, I didn't think. Um, but again, with that push from my parents, um, the first couple years, take the math and science and then see where that takes you. And I will tell you, I got the opportunity to do an internship um, after my sophomore year at school. And while I was working a very technical problem, I was able to see the bigger picture. It was a problem where we had some O-rings that they were concerned about. And the question was, did the supplier change the material enough that we would have to pull out some missiles that were out in the field? So this was working with the Department um, of Defense. I, of course, wasn't interfacing with them. I was a young engineer collecting detailed data. But I, I got to see the value of seeing that bigger picture and the importance of fact-based information and then understanding how applying technology to solve problems and bringing solutions forward ultimately kind of came together. And while I continue to become an engineer, I kind of focused on the bigger picture, the integration of the problem, and then working with really talented people that could help me take what I thought was a vision or a strategy and see a result. So, but, you know, there's been a lot of conversation today um, on social media and in the news and in the press about women in technical fields and the fact that they're, women are just underrepresented in, in the technical sectors. It, but, you know, you know, and you and I are about the same age, so when you were coming up, it was probably even more pronounced about, you know, the lack of women in the technical fields. Thoughts on that? You know, what, what, what's, the, is there, what's the real issue with this? Why, why don't you think more young women think about technical careers, engineering, engineering careers as, as kind of viable career options for them? It's a great question. When I went to school, there was probably a handful of women in engineering, and probably by the time I graduated, there was maybe three of us that graduated at the same time. Um, so you do get a lot of, you know, women, one, not interested. It's a tough curriculum. Um, I think also they don't have the support group at home. I mean, I obviously had a father, and I also had a sister who was in chemical engineering, another brother in mechanical engineering. And so I at least had the support group at home that kind of helped you through it and, I guess, the mentorship that you need. And I don't think there's been a lot of women who have been mentors to the younger generation. And so as I have kind of finished in my you know, my work career in terms of being a CEO working 24-7, my goal right now is, in addition to the board work that I'm doing, is to really give back and try to influence and inspire, be a mentor where I can, um, or connect um, young men and women with other people that can help them kind of keep that energizing passion that they have that I think I gained from my family, but also in space exploration. I mean, that ignites the your spirit, it kind of fuels your innovative passions, you know, and it just sparks, you know, the ideas of coming up with something new. And so if I can be that, you know, inspiration to somewhere else, then it's my time to do that for others. So what was it like your first day at NASA? I mean, I can't imagine, you know, going to work for NASA, given particularly, you know, you were kind of catching it with space shuttle programs. That's where you kind of came into NASA, right? Yeah, I did. And, you know, it was a fascinating. I'd worked in the industry for a short period of time, and I was working with some NASA employees um, on a technical um, characterization of some materials. And so I said, how do I get the chance to work on the space program? I'd love the opportunity. So they kind of told me a way of, about getting there. And so when I got my foot in the door to go work at NASA, it was a dream come true. But I will tell you, I had to learn a lot. I had a lot of people who came straight out of school at the very top school. I and mean, not that I didn't go to a top school. University of Utah is a phenomenal school to get your mechanical engineering degree. But I was up against the likes of Notre Dame, MIT, you know, um, Georgia Tech, and I had to prove that I knew something. So I rolled up my sleeves, I studied, I asked lots of questions, and I got engaged. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that is – you know, one of the things that, you know, when, when I met you, you were at NASA, um, you were kind enough to invite myself and my family down to watch the shuttle launch for the U.S. module. And I, like I said, it, you know, NASA is impressive. When you talk about scale, 
and commitment and doing a job that's more than just yourself. The, you know, really having a mission. So we're going to come back. We're going to pick this up. You're going to want to hear these stories. I know some of Gretchen's stories. I'm going to weave them out of there. When we come back, we're going to pick up right where we left off. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network, and we're going to be right back after this short commercial break. So don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Kill Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We're going to pick up our conversation here with Gretchen McLean. Gretchen, as we were talking about in the first segment, when I met her, she was the, the chief director on the International Space Station Program at NASA. And like I was saying, Gretchen, I couldn't imagine. You know, I, was, I was a space geek, I, you know, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, all the way Apollo 13 and, and all that activities, all the way through the Apollo program and then the shuttle. I remember as a kid, I had a Chicago Tribune centerfold. It was a breakout drawing of the entire space shuttle design on my wall in my bedroom. And actually, it was, NASA was one of the inspirations for why I went in and become, became an engineer. But you got to live everybody's dream of working at NASA and being part of such a critical program, which was in the space station. So we were, at the end, we were getting ready to go to commercial break. We kind of we left off the, your, your conversations of that, uh, that experience of going to work for NASA. But let's talk specifically about the programs that you were involved in, specifically the International Space Station, because it was a very unique structure to how that program all came together for NASA. So much to, walk us through that a little bit. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, and, and, you know, I, I will tell you, I, I think, you know, my beginnings at NASA really helped me understand one really critical point, which is if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Um, it's an African proverb, which when you work on a space program and a space mission specifically, you work extremely hard. You know your accountability and your responsibility, but you also know you're one link of a bit, very big chain and you better know what's happening in front of you and behind you and, and, and make sure it's working together. Um, and so it's critical. That whole teamwork spirit that I gained there has been so helpful to me as I've, I advanced in my career. But bringing the Russians in, think about this. Here we have the Russians who have been our competitors. You know, here, um, and it's, you know, it's what you see in industry today. You've got your biggest competitor out there. And so our first reaction when the administration came forward and said, let's work with the Russians for a more peaceful endeavor, um, we all said, well, maybe this will just go away in six months and we won't really have to happen. You know? And so the heads went down and kind of ignored it. And then we all realized, no, if we really want a space program, we had to make this work. And so once we got past the little bit of the competitor nature and we really got focused on, guess what? We're all trying to get to the same end state. And, you know, here you go back to Kennedy when he set the stage and said, you know, we need to commit ourselves to put a man on the moon and bring him home safely within the next de decade. And so you think about the space station. We all wanted to go and build a colony in space and learn how men and women adapt in space so ultimately we could go into outer space. And so we kind of decided that, guess what? We all had the same end game in mind. And in my belief is when you lead with the power of vision, you actually let extraordinary, uh, extraordinary goals really inspire exceptional talent to do something new and innovate. And so once we got past the language barrier and we recognized that the Russians really had unbelievable experience in long duration space, and you sat back and said, what does the U.S. have? Well, we had extraordinary um, experience in short duration space. And so learning together about what we could learn from how you train astronauts and cosmonauts for six months into space is very different than what you train for 16 days in mission, on a mission. And so we started learning that we could gain knowledge from each other, not only in that aspect, but in the way we design systems, our redundancy, and we got past that where we decided it was okay to work together and we were successful. And that's, but that is unique though, right? When you think about it, they are the enemy, but going back to your quote, right? But if you want to go far, you have to go together. Right. And the International Space Station really became that rallying cry because it's not just the Russians, right? Japan's got their module. You know, there's a bunch of, the, the, the European Union's got their modules. It really did become kind of this unifying time when world peace was so critical 
that the space station almost became the, that, that symbol of, yes, we can work together. We may have differences in other areas, but there's also things that we can work together on and actually be successful in the form of, you know, you go out there, you go out there at night and look up and you can watch the, 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 the International Space Station go overhead. Oh, absolutely. I mean, here, you know, here we have our own nation's issues and, and, and political issues. But you put that all aside because we had a mission at, at hand and we knew we could learn from each other and bring the best minds and the best talents from around the world to make it happen. Let alone you can't, only one nation can't afford this. So it was an exciting time. It was a challenging time. Don't, don't kid myself that, you know, there were times that ultimately we didn't get along, um, but we found a way to get through it. Um, and if it wasn't the U.S. having a funding issue, it was the Japanese having a funding issue or someone delayed in Russia for not being able to get the hardware done. But we came together and, and we made it work. And to me today, when I look up in the sky, as you said, we have an international space station that is still usable even when we have our shuttle that's not flying anymore. Had we not gone together with the Russians, we would not be having a space station today. Well, we would be able to put astronauts up and get yeah. the research benefit. We'd be sitting idle. So you could either call that incredible foresight. <laughs> um, for a little bit of luck, I think, goes along, yeah. along that way. There's always, you know, there's always a little bit of luck when it comes to uh, these, these kinds of things. Talk a little bit about your experience, though, you know, because in, in the case at that time in the United States, NASA was going through massive funding cuts. You know, so it was a, I can just imagine the battles and trying to convince Congress to continue to, you know, to put any kind of money in, much less the International Space Station. So let's talk real quickly about what it was like on that, on the administrative side. That was, a very, that was very much of a challenge. And I think, you know, even in the space industry at that time, um, we even, it was somewhat fragmented and every player wanted to have the full piece of the pie. Um, and I think everyone figured out very quickly early in the space station development that if we wanted to get the vote from the Congress and the House that we had to come together. We all weren't going to be the big piece. We all had to share the piece of the pie. And I think when we realized that, we were able to move forward. But it was a put and take. Um, I remember going to hearings, talking to senators, congressmen, women, um, many, many times trying to explain it, you know, explain the benefit of the space station and how exploring the unknown would bring technology that would benefit us here on Earth, as well as it would open up doors for us into the future. And I just think of the technology that we've gained across this globe um, in so many different areas that we wouldn't have today had it not been to the space program. Well, exactly. And in fact, you know, my wife, Michelle, who you know, is a nurse, and she constantly is reminded every day when blood, blood oximeters go on to like neonates or even on our fingers, right? That's, that is an outgrowth of the space program. That's a spin-off technology. There's literally thousands. I used to be a subscriber to NASA tech briefs when I was a kid. So I, I, could, I could reset, you know, 2,000 technologies that came out of uh, NASA. So, so I'm, I'm, oh, I'm geeking out here on the NASA thing. Okay, I'm going to tone this down. We're going to talk about Gretchen's career post-NASA when we come back and talk about how she translated that experience into ultimate uh, executive career success, ultimately uh, in the CEO roles at companies. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this quick commercial break. Welcome back to Kino Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We're picking up our conversation here with Gretchen McLean. Uh, Gretchen, as I said, we, we've known each other for quite some time. She's the former chief director of International Space Station at NASA. We've talked, uh, we've got it, we geeked out on the NASA thing for the first half. Gretchen, what I want to do is talk now about, you know, after you left NASA, you went out and had progressively more important roles out in the commercial world. And it's always, I've always been impressed because when you think about, okay, government work, working for, a, you, know, you know, something within the U.S. government and translating that into commercial. I've had some personal experiences where it's worked well. I've also had work where it hasn't translated very well, but you're the kind of the poster child of translating that experience to phenomenal career success. Tell us your story. You know, well, let me, tell, let me tell you a funny story about that. When I left NASA, um, I went to work for Allied Signal, which today is Honeywell. Um, and when I, I left, um, the, the gentleman who, who, who uh, hired me um, into the aerospace side of the house 
um, didn't show, share this with me until two years later. But anyways, I went in, I actually helped them turn around some of their programs. Um, Honeywell, or Allied Signal at the time, was phenomenal on their technology, and, and so I went into the mechanical side of the house, um, helped them work their programs that were read, um, and really get with their customers and understand what the issues were, get their programs back on schedule and on performance, um, and we had some really good success. And in that, in, in doing that, I really got to understand who was who at Allied Signal, what the processes were, and so I really came in on my comfort zone something that I knew I knew how to do, while in the meantime I got to understand the company. And then very shortly after that they gave me one of uh, my very first P&L to run. So coming out of the government, not for profit, to a for profit, um, I had to learn very quickly. So one of the things I did is I grabbed hold of one of the really strong, talented um, financial leader. And I said, Bill, teach me everything you can, help me see what I see through your eyes as a finance leader. And I will tell you, having understood what he saw, was able, I was able then to either change my argument or I could ultimately say it was a bad idea, I've got to rethink this and bring forward another idea. But had I not learned that financial backbone, I wouldn't have been successful. So back to my original story, two years after I came on board at Allied Signal, uh, my boss, who was the CEO of Aerospace, pulls me in and says, I had gotten a note from the CEO of Allied Signal, and he had said, we'll have to watch Gretchen very closely because most people won't make it from the private industry, I mean, public, from government to the private industry. You pass the test. So, you know, thankfully you didn't send, show that to me two years earlier because I probably would have been a nervous wreck. But I will tell you, it was a different learning. I had to go in and prove myself because when I was at NASA, when Gretchen spoke, everyone had to listen because I had worked my way up there. And here I was someone new. What does she know? She's always worked in the government. And I had to roll up my sleeves and demonstrate my value while listening and learning from them. And over time, I was able to build a great team and get success. Well, I think this also ties into what we were talking about during the commercial break, which was around fear, right, about stepping out, right? In this case, you, you, you went ahead, you didn't hesitate and say, well, no, 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 I don't want that P&L role because I don't know anything about finance. You said, oh, give me the P&L role. I'll go learn the finance. Yeah. Well, two factors to that, Phil. You know my husband, Mark. He's always been probably my, my, my biggest critic, my best friend, my biggest push, and my biggest supporter. And he's always was saying, Gretchen, you can do more. But he also had my back at all times. Um, and so he pushed me and said this would be a great opportunity. Um, so that was very, very helpful. And I will tell you, those first six months was a roller coaster. There were times I'm saying, why did I make the change? Um, but then there were such rewards because I was stretching myself. I was learning. I saw some success. I also saw some failure. But through that, you know, it opened my eyes to different opportunities that would have never, you know, opened up um, that allowed me to just continue to develop in different ways I would have never thought of in college. So you went from, you know, from mechanical engineering into NASA to ultimately become the chief director for National Space Station to now you are at Allied Signal, which didn't get, and you were there when Honeywell bought Allied Signal. Correct, and GE then yeah. almost bought us, but that didn't happen. You got sucked in, so, so then you got a little bit of M&A experience. I, I did, I did, and I actually, you know, I started on the mechanical side, and then I got the opportunity to run the P&L on the avionics side. So, you know, while I knew the business jet market, I didn't know the ones and zero of, of avionics and elect, electrical engineering, which was probably my worst studies in college. Um, but what I found out, it wasn't the ones and zeros they needed help with. The biggest problems we were having in the aviation side of it was the packaging of it. So we had all these controls that were different sizes, all customized for the customer, of course, costing us way too much. We were delayed on our schedules. And so what I quickly found out is I could rely on my mechanical engineers on the other side of the house. And likewise, when I was on the mechanical side, the biggest problems we had were our software issues. So Integration of technology, as you know, is our biggest innovation, and getting the teams to work together and combining that knowledge has really helped me understand how you solve problems. Well, and I think that also applies to your, your strength from NASA, right? Getting yes. all different teams all over the place to play nice, work together, get out of silos, right? 
there's nothing bigger than government, you know, country silos, U.S., Russia, Japan, you know, the here you're just dealing with, with silos inside of an organization, right? Yeah, and you know, what's interesting is that just kind of led me to my next career step, which was, you know, I got the opportunity in, in NASA to understand, you know, we were down to one vote and an industry having to come together. And now I got the opportunity to go work in the water industry. And a lot of people are saying, why would you go, Gretchen? It's pumps, it's valves, it's not very sexy. But I stepped back and said, we've got a world issue problem around water. And the one thing I loved about working at NASA was that bigger ambition, that bigger purpose. And so now going into water, and while we built pumps and valves and very important technology quality, um, so I had the technology piece of it, you could do so much more in terms of bringing now a very fragmented water industry and say, hey, it's time for us to work together and solve this problem rather than just talking about, you know, if I'm involved in wastewater, I'll talk about wastewater. If I'm, on, if I'm involved in potable clean water, let's just talk about that. Or if I want to talk about groundwater, I only want to talk about groundwater. And I think finally, we're not there yet, but we're starting to see the water industry starting to say, hey, we've got to solve this all together. We can't just be looking at our each individual goals. Right. And I think, you know, you're, you're getting back to your point around, you know, almost you know, uh, mission-based careers, right? Yeah. Solving the bigger problems than how do I make a better widget and get a bunch of people to pay for it, but solving almost foundational issues that we're facing as a society. You know, here in the U.S., most people, not everybody, but most people have access to, to you know, the clean water. But I do a lot of work in Africa. You've got a lot of experience on a global basis also. That's not universal, right? Water's a challenge, it is. It is. And even today where we get access to water um, and, and our wastewater is taken care of, the aged infrastructure we're dealing with, you know, really opened up its eyes when we saw the storm Sandy a few years back. And, you know, we're, we're seeing in California the dam is about to break. And, you know, so there's technology that we've got to be addressing and we've got to do it in a way that's lower cost. It's addressing the need of the, the population today. And so, you know, one of the things that's really needed in the water industry is a smart infrastructure. And so how do we bring this innovative technology that so many are coming out of college or small startups into some of these established industries or businesses and make sure that we can keep them alive rather than killing them because we know how to do it because we're the old stodgy, you know, industry from the, from the past. So we're getting ready to go to commercial break, but real quick, Right now, you're not playing, you're not in an executive role. You're coaching and mentoring. You're on a bunch of public boards. You've got some private boards. And then you've got you kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, your pay it forward process of working with young college students. So when I come back, what I want to ask you is you can come back with two or three pieces of advice. Given your career success for someone that's in college today, what would be the two or three pieces of advice you would give them for ultimately having a high impact, high success kind of a kind of a career? So I'm going to give you the commercial break to think about that. And this is always one I, you know, for those of you who are regular listeners, you know I pull this truck on all the guests, right? I always ask them to give our give our listeners kind of that, um, you know, the walkaways. What is it that we can we can walk away? And I'm sure even though I've asked Gretchen to do this specifically on the um, you know, from the standpoint of uh, uh, new college grads, I'm sure that it applies to all of us, right? Because many of us are in careers we came out of college for, but we're looking for that high impact mission kind of career. And what does that really take? So Gretchen, I'll give you the commercial break to think about that. And when we come back, we're going to pick up this conversation in the last segment of the show. So don't go anywhere. You're not going to want to miss this. We're going to be right back after this quick commercial break. You're listening to Kill Innovations on the BizTalk Radio Network. Welcome back to Q Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We're gonna pick up our conversation here with Gretchen McLean. but before we do that, I gotta make uh, one quick announcement here. We gotta thank our sponsor. The sponsor for today's show is Zoom. If you're a longtime listener, you know that I'm a big Zoom fan. Gretchen is actually joining us uh, using Zoom. Zoom is just one of those video collaboration tools that I've been using for over a year. As you know, we don't, bring on sponsors very often, and we only bring on sponsors where I've been using the technology long before they ever become a sponsor. Best video, best audio, best collaboration technology. I use it every day. I'm on six to eight Zoom meetings every day, Monday through Friday, it's just part of my job. So 
Zoom has been a long time sponsor. Go check them out. They've given us access to give you a free account. You can sign up for a free account, which allows you to bring together 50 video participants. So you can have, you can throw a party. You can have your family join you virtually. So check it out. Visit killerinnovations.com slash Zoom, and you can get that free account. So Gretchen, we left at the, the end. I asked you to come up with a couple of kind of suggestions for whether, you know, New people that are, you know, young people that are in college, men and women, and, and those maybe just coming out about in the early parts of their career, given the, the success that you've had over your entire career experience, what would be those two or three pieces of advice that you would give them? What would you have said to a, to a 25-year-old Gretchen if you had the chance? So first of all, believe in you or believe in me in that situation. And when I say that, I mean empower yourself. Surround yourself with the smartest people you can because they're pushing you, stretching you in ways that you, you know, while it's tough and it's uncomfortable, um, they'll make you a better person. And declare yourself. Tell people what you want to do and where your passions lie and where you kind of want to go. Um, so believe in yourself and to me makes all the difference. It kind of helps you set the path. And not that your path is always defined. Mine wasn't. And I could have never written the path that my, my career took. But I think believing in yourself and, and, and convincing yourself that you really can do some things um, is important. Second, I mentioned it earlier in the show, um, is lead with the power of vision. The more you can explain you know, kind of directionally where you're going, getting your team bought in on that vision, it doesn't mean you always have to define it. You have to own it, but you're working with your team. Then it kind of gives that you know, common, shared, inspirational vision that allow people to lift their arms, raise their wings, and, and really innovate and explore and bring results forward. And the third thing would be what I refer to as, you know, staying in that first time mode, that rookie mode when you did something. And, you know, I'll go back to the time I gave my first speech and I had to, I was scared to death at that point in time to give a speech. And I had to go to Las Vegas and I was in college, and so you're going to Las Vegas, the last thing you want to do is get a technical presentation. And the people that were in the audience were industry leaders. And I was worried that I wouldn't know all my stuff. So I studied, I studied, I called the guys that I had worked on some of the experiments with, um, got through the presentation, started out rough, but got through it, was feeling comfortable, and then the questions come. And of course, because I had planned and I had prepared and I'd gotten ready, you know, I knew all the questions, or if I didn't, I at least said I can get back to you, and I felt comfortable enough, but it helped break through that. But I was scared to death, but I proved to myself, and I proved to others I could do it. And so if you can stay in that rookie mode, to me, that pushes you to create the greatest work you'll ever do. I also refer to it at times as having that tension between the confidence in your, in your stomach and the butterflies in your stomach. That good tension kind of gets you out over your skis, but not too far over your skis keeps you producing your best work. Yeah, I've also heard you refer to this as um, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Because growth and comfort don't coexist. You ask anyone in their career who really created something new or challenged something, you know, being that uncomfortable is where you grow and develop in yourself, but you develop around other people and it gives you great confidence, but yet Enough to say, I don't know it all. i got to keep looking around the corner and asking those questions and innovating because someone else is right behind me. Gretchen, these are great. You know, one, believe in yourself. Two, lead with this power of vision. Get that common shared inspiration. And I love, I love this. This is definitely going to become a tweet. You know, stay in the rookie mode. Right? That is, that, I think that is probably the best summarization of, you know, be out there, be willing to try new things. Don't, uh, don't, don't uh, self-doubt yourself. Take that risk. It may, not, it may not work out. It may stumble getting there, but it's when you take those opportunities that, that well, do. How many times have we raised our hand and then you go back and you say, I didn't really mean to. I got selected, so how am I going to do this? And you worry about it and so forth, but you, you know, you're not going to go back and say, no, I'm not going to do it, but you get yourself through it and you've learned yourself. Um, and you gained a lot of credibility and you get through that fear. Well, it's going to be interesting because a bunch of my, my staff in my current job listen to the podcast, so they're going to find this is being really funny. I raised that hand and then I went, oh, no, what did, yeah. I just, what did I just volunteer for back in June of 12 when I took over the CEO for Cable Labs? Not having much – I've been CEO once before, a very, very small startup, but had never really um, – 
had uh, and I had no and no no background in the industry. I didn't come from a cable industry background, right? I'm a consumer electronics guy. So, so yes, stay in the rookie mode. Rate, don't be afraid to raise your hand and uh, you know and lean forward, go for it. So Gretchen, if people want to follow what you're doing, what's the best way for them to reach you? Two ways. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, so um, connect through me there or through email. It's G McLean M C C L A I N at GretchenMcLean.com. Great. And we'll have all those links up on the show notes. So as we wrap up today's show, I want to remind you, we will not be live in the studio for the next four weeks. I'm on my Asia Pacific innovation tour. So follow me on, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'll be posting there during the entire trip, what I see, what I find interesting. So you want to, you want us follow over there to keep, keep up with what's going on. I will be available by email. So, Hey, feel free, drop me a note. You can always ask me how my vacation is going or at least, my pseudo vacation, as my wife reminds me, it's not really a vacation when, uh, when I go on vacation because I'm always trying to find uh, the newest and greatest stuff. Go over to the show notes. We'll have Gretchen's contact information, the show notes from today's show over at killinnovations.com. There you can find the archive to all the shows going back to uh, 2005. Uh, if I could ask one favor, hop on over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Give us a rating. Let people know about the show. It's our way to pay it forward. All of our content here on the Innovation Show has been free for the 12 years. We're starting, this is actually show one of season 13 today. So you're going to want to uh, share that right there. So we're going to sign off now. Appreciate you taking the time out of your Sunday. Don't let the innovation antibodies get you down. Get out there and innovate each and every day. Bye-bye, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.